All right. Good evening, guys. Let's continue our review. So diseases of the pulmonary system. So <clears throat> chronic bronchitis versus emphysema. Most common risk factor, tobacco smoking. High yield for all COPD, alpha-1 antitrypsin, also and some environmental factors. So pathogenesis for chronic bronchitis, you have excessive mucus production that narrows the airway. Don't forget read index, you need to measure the enlargement in the mucus glands. And emphysema, you have a destruction of the alveolar walls due to relative excess in elastase activity. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, the normal function of alpha-1 antitrypsin is to inhibit um, elastase. The normal function of elastase is to eat up the um, lining of your alveolar walls. So if you have an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, your elastase will gonna run amok, right? And we're gonna eat your alveolar um, walls. High yield elastase is released from neutrophils in your macro pages. Don't forget tobacco smoking. If you smoke, it increases your polymorphonucleus, your neutrophils, and macro pages. Okay. Now, high yield, I want you to know the two kinds of emphysema centrilobular emphysema and panlobular emphysema. Who can tell me? The pathology of centrilobular emphysema. Most common type seen in what? Commonly seen in smokers, right? Destruction is limited to where? Where in the respiratory tract? Upper lobes. Where? Yes, because it's 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 um smoking, right? It goes up. But specifically the respiratory bronchioles, the proximal acini, okay? There is no change in the distal ACNI, only in the proximal ACNI, and predilection for upper lung zones. Contrast that one with panlobular emphysema, commonly seen in patients with what? Commonly seen in patients with alpha one antitrypsin, antitrypsin deficiency, anti one, alpha one antitrypsin. Excellent. Destruction involves what? Proximal and distal ACNI, and predilection for lung bases. Okay. That's a quick patho for central lobular versus panlobular emphysema. Other clinical features, signs and symptoms, you can have that one. Signs, prolonged expiratory time with first lip breathing, right? You need to increase the peep pressure for your um, obstructive lung diseases. Another high yield point, what can we see? in your pulmonary function test, your PFT. So you have a decreased FEV1, FVC ratio. Oh, what happens to residual volume in COPD? What happens to residual volume? Increase residual increased. volume. Increase residual volume. Why do we have increased residual volume? Increase RV, why? Because air trapping. Of air trapping. Excellent. So if RV is increased, what happens to FRC? Functional residual capacity. Increase or decrease? Increase. Increase. FRC is increased. What happens to functional vital capacity? Or your VC is also increased. What happens to TLC? Total lung capacity. It's also increased. Okay. So COPD, RV is increased. TLC is increased, FEV1, FVC ratio is decreased. Now, guys, put a star here. Just by describing to you the patient, you already know if it's emphysema or bronchitis. Just by looking at the vignette, right? So emphysema, pink puffer. They're going to be thin, right? Why? Because they need excess energy during breathing. They have this increased energy expenditure. When sitting down, they lean forward. This is what we call the tripod position, right? They have a barrel chest. So you have an increased AP diameter of the chest. So emphysema, pink puffer, thin tripod position, barrel chest. Okay, 
they use accessory muscles, especially in the neck. That's emphysema. Chronic bronchitis, blue bloater, overweight, cyanotic, chronic cough and sputum production, core pulmonal, right ventricular, heart failure, right? Respiratory rate is normal, and the patient is in no apparent distress, okay? Since we're talking about FEV1, FBC ratio, what, what, what do you mean by FEV1? This is the amount of air that can be forced out of the lungs in one second. What's the principle? The lower the FEV1, the more difficulty one has breathing. The lower the FEV1, the more difficulty one has with breathing. How are we diagnosed? Obstructive lung diseases. PFT, of course, the definitive diagnostic test. You have decreased FEV1 and decreased FEV1 FBC ratio. What happens to TLC? Increase. What happens to RV? Increase. What happens to FRC? Increase. Why? Air trapping. Right? What happens? So, um, in order to diagnose airway obstruction, right, one must have a normal or increased TLC with a decrease. FEV1 um, ratio. Now, a patient comes in. You're doing the history. This is your OSCE. You're doing the history, taking in someone who has um, COPD. So check the history of smoking history, family history of COPD, occupation. Are they exposed to industrial dust or fumes? Check for history of respiratory infections, frequency severity. Check for hospitalization for COPD or exacerbations. Check if they have pulmonary medications. When we're talking about symptoms of COPD, check for dyspnea. You need to quanti um, quantitate the severity of the dyspnea. Check for coughing. Sputum production. Check quantity, quality, duration hemoptysis, and check for wheezing, okay? Another high yield point, put a star here, obstructive versus restrictive lung disease about the pulmonary function testing, okay? Chest x-ray, what can we see, right? Hyperinflation, flattened diaphragm, diminished vascular markings. Check also alpha-1 antitrypsin levels and ABGs. COPD leads to what? Metabolic acidosis or respiratory acidosis? COPD leads to what? Chronic respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis? Respiratory acidosis? Respiratory acidosis. Therefore, what is the compensation if it's respiratory acidosis? Metabolic alkalosis is your compensation. Right? Don't forget that one. What's the treatment then? Tell your patient, stop smoking. That's the most important intervention. High yield. There's a caveat though. See here? Around 35, FEV1 decreases approximately 25 to 30 ml per year. If a smoker quits, the rate of decline slows so that someone of the same age was never smoked. However, quitting does not result in complete reversal. So what does it do then? Smoking cessation, it prolongs the survival rate, but does not reduce it to the level of someone who has never smoked. Okay, that's high yield point, guys. What else can we give as a treatment? You can give hypertrophin bromide or bron bronchodilators. Um, use long-acting anticholinergics, example, thiotropium for patients with severe symptoms. Ah, lung volumes, know them and love them. Okay, so I have a question for you. Clinical monitoring of COPD patient. What do you need to do if, if um, patient has COPD in hospital inpatient, they're in the hospital? What are you going to, uh, how are you going to monitor them? Pulse oximetry, check their O2SAT. Check also the FEV1 measurement. This is high yield. This has the highest predictive value. Check the severity of symptoms, um, like cough, sputum, breathlessness, all right? 
high yield, only smoking cessation and home oxygen therapy. Those are the only two. Those are the only interventions that lower the mortality rate, prevents death from COPD. High yield, low volume loops. The red one is normal. Obstruction is there. It shifts to the left. Restrictive lung diseases, it shifts to the right. Okay? So please know this one. Obstruction shifts to the left. Restriction, it shifts to the right. Okay, what else can we give? Bronchodilators, albuterol, combination, beta agonist albuterol with ipratropium bromide. You can also have corticosteroids. Follow these drugs, guys. No mechanism of action, side effects. Right? Those are the most important um, things. Treat COPD with bronchodilators, anticholinergics, beta agonists, or both. Give steroids. The only time that you give steroids and antibiotics if they have acute exacerbations. Okay? High yield. I know this. Um, maybe you know this one from term one. Beta blockers are contraindicated in what? What two conditions? You don't give beta blockers. COPD and... Beta blockers are contraindicated in acute COPD and asthma um, exacerbations. Okay. Theophylline, the role is controversial for this one. So this is like a picture, a chest radiograph, chest x-ray, showing a patient with a COPD. All right. This is like um, a diagram, so smoking and COPD. So you can have an age-related um, rate of decline in lung function in a non-smoker on top, see this one, and a susceptible smoker at the bottom. So the dashed line indicates the beneficial effects of smoking cessation with a moderate and severe disease. The accelerated decline in lung function approaches the normal rate, significantly delaying the onset of disability and death. So tell your patient, Stop smoking. Uh, I encountered this one in the hospital. Ruflumilast. I don't know this. Phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. You can give ruflumilast um, now. It promotes smooth muscle relaxation and decreases inflammation. It reduces the risk of frequent exacerbations of COPD. Remember, glucocorticoids are only used for acute exacerbations, not for long-term treatment. Okay, oxygen therapy, yes, it can be shown to improve survival and quality and pulmonary rehabilitation. I have a question, guys. Remember COPD, do you give, you can give oxygen, right? But not 100% oxygen. Why? Doesn't Why? it shut down the body's? Um, so the BRG, right? Your ventral respiratory group and your dorsal yeah. respiratory group in the pons. So the criteria now for your continuous or intermittent long-term oxygen therapy in COPD, make sure the PaO2 is less than 55. No, not less than. PaO2 55 millimeters of mercury or O2 sat less than 88, either at rest or during exercise. Or... PAO to 52 to 59, right? If they have like polycythemia vera or like core pulmonale, all right? So the main thing is make sure that the PAO2 is 55-ish, 55, and the O2 set is less than or equal to 88%. That's it, okay? Vaccination, yeah, you can give them like influenza, strep pneumo, antibiotics, of course. Surgery, last resort. Right, lung resection and lung transplantation. <clears throat> okay. Treatment guidelines. This is high yield. If they have low risk of ex exacerbation, what can you give? Bronchodilator. Right, via an inhaler. Okay. You can also give inhaled glucocorticoids only for acute exacerbations. Okay. How about high risk exacerbations? The whole shebang. Bronchodilator, corticosteroid, reflumilast, theophylline, continuous oxygen um, therapy. 
For acute COPD, you can give bronchodilators, corticosteroids, antibiotics, and supplemental um, oxygen. Remember, what's the goal? What's the treatment? Treatment goals for COPD, you need to reduce the number and severity of the exacerbations they experience each year. Okay, pulmonary infection, right, is one of the main precipitants of a COPD exacerbation. Give me some bacteria that can cause pulmonary infection in someone who has COPD. Strep pneumonia. What else? Kib, Haemophilus influenza. What else? A typical, a typical pneumonia, mycoplasma pneumonia. Mm. What else? Another typical, Moraxella. Uh, Moraxella, Moraxella catarrhalis. Those are the like ma main precipitants of a COPD exacerbation. So what are the complications then for acute exacerbations? Most common cause are infection. So there's a pulmonary infection. High yield, one of the main precipitants of a COPD exacerbation, they have a pulmonary infection. Another one, complications is secondary polycythemia. Why? You're hypoxic, okay? So there's a compensatory response of your body to chronic hypoxemia. Another complication, high yield pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonale, if, if, if they have long-standing COPD, who have chronic. Um, hypoxemia. So doctors, a patient comes in, COPD exacerbation. What are you going to order? Chest x-ray. What's the treatment? Beta, agonist, anticholinergic inhalers, systemic corticosteroids. Remember, it's an acute COPD exacerbation. Antibiotics, of course. Why? The most common precipitant is pulmonary infection. Supplementary ox uh, supplemental oxygen, yes, PaO2 of 55 and O2 saturation of less than or equal to 88%. Okay? Now, question. Contrast COPD with asthma. Which one is reversible? Asthma or the other two? Asthma. Asthma, right? So when you give the bronchodilator and there's an improvement in function, it is asthma. So a triad, inflammation, hyperresponsiveness, and reversible airflow obstruction. Highlight that word, that's important, reversible airflow obstruction. It can begin at any age. Extrinsic, intrinsic. Extrinsic is atopy. Um, you have um, IgE to environmental antigens, associated with what? Eczema and hay fever. In the vignette, if the patient has eczema, and hay fever and asthma, it's almost extrinsic, right? So you have IgE. The body is producing IgE against environmental um, antigens. Most common triggers, you can read them there. Signs and symptoms of someone who has acute severe asthma attack, tachypnea, diaphoresis, wheezing, speaking in incomplete sentences, they have use of accessory muscles, they have a paradoxic movement of the abdomen and diaphragm on inspiration. This is a sign of impending respiratory failure. So remember guys, if the patient is wheezing, right? The most common cause of wheezing is asthma. However, in your differential diagnosis, right? Any condition that mimics large airway bronchospasm can cause wheezing. Question guys, give me a condition that mimics Wheezing and asthma. RSV. What? RSV infection. RS, Respiratory RS infection. Issue. Bronchitis, usually inspiratory strider for that one. We don't usually see a wheezing. Think about CHF that we talked about. CHF, you have edema of the airways and con um, congestion of the bronchial mucosa. Think about lung cancer right? Obstruction of the airways, whether there's a central tumor or mediastinal invasion. Think about um, cardiomyopathies that we talk about that one and pericardial diseases. Why? There's an edema around the bronchi. COPD, inflamed airways can be narrowed, so you can have bronchospasm may be present. The main point here is the most common cause of wheezing is asthma. Yes, however, not all wheezing is asthma. 
OK, that's the main point. How are we going to diagnose then asthma? PFTs, of course, you can do spirometry. High yield PFTs in asthma. What can we see? Decrease FEV1, FVC, and FEV1, FVC ratio. If you give albuterol, what happens to FEV1? It increases. You have an increase in FEV1 with albuterol. If you give metacholine or histamine challenge to a patient, you have a decrease in FEV1. Let me repeat. Pulmonary function test in asthma. Overall, you have decreased FEV1, FVC, and FEV1, FVC ratio. Why? It's an obstructive lung disease. If you give albuterol, what happens to FEV1? Improvement. It's increased. If you give metacholine or histamine, remember, metacholine is a bronchoconstriction, right? So you have a decrease in FEV1. We don't use metacholine in the clinical setting, but in the boards, that's the correct answer. So bronchial um, provocation um, test, right? So we give metacholine challenge for this. You can see hyper-responsive um, airways develop obstruction at lower doses of metacholine, thereby decreasing the FEV1 ratio. The lower the FEV1, you are much harder to breathe, okay? That's the point. So, um, although asthma, can be diagnosed with pulmonary function tests and you do all your spirometry. In the emergency, right, when your patient is dyspneic or having shortness of breath, um, you use peak flow. Peak flow measurement is the quickest method of your <clears throat> diagnosis. All right, asthma exacerbation. What happens? Hyperventilation or hypoventilation? During asthma exacerbation, what happens? to the ventilatory rate, increase or decrease? Increase. Increase, so you have hyperventilation. What happens to PaCO2? Increase or decrease? To PaCO2. This is physiology. Decrease. Now decrease. A low PaCO2. Asthma exacerbation, the patient hyperventilates. What happens to PaCO2 leading to a low PaCO2 um, levels? If the patient is no longer hyperventilating, meaning the CO2 is normal or high, this could be a sign that the patient is decompensating due to fatigue. The respiratory muscles are kaput, right? And this is a sign that the patient may be intubated. That intubation may be require okay so that's a clinical um aspect for you guys so just x-ray what can we see well you know you can see hyperinflation yada yada abg's hypocarbia is um common right abg is, is considered in significant respiratory um distress how are we going to treat asthma high yield inhaled beta 2 agonist you give albuterol and then long acting version is salmeterol do we give beta blockers in asthmatics? No, avoid beta blockers in asthmatics. What else can we give aside from beta blockers? Corticosteroids for moderate to severe asthma. Montelukast, your leukotriene modifiers, they all end in cast, K-A-S-T, right? You can give theophylline, right? So I wanted to put a star here. Chronic treatment of asthma, mild persistent, low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So you give, excuse me, you give um, inhaled beta agonist, and then you just add on, right? It's mild persistent, moderate. You just add on. You have beta agonist. You have inhaled corticosteroids. If it's severe, you can give long acting beta two agonist. You can also give um. Or malizumab may be considered as an uh, additional, okay? But mainly, if it's mild to moderate persistent, you give X, your um, inhaled corticosteroids, and a beta-2 agonist, all right? So don't forget, guys, side effects of inhaled corticosteroids, sore throat, candidiasis, oral candidiasis, and hoarseness.
So, if you're giving inhaled corticosteroids to a patient, use a spacer, right? And tell the patient to rinse the mouth to minimize the side effects. As a physician, what are you going, what tests are you going to order for acute asthma exacerbation? ABGs. What do you expect in ABGs? Since it's asthma, increase AA, the gradient. AA gradient is increased. Chest x-ray, of course, why? Rule out pneumonia or pneumothorax. Peak expiratory flow is decreased in asthma. So we talk about the treatment, yada, yada, yada. Complications of asthma, high yield. Status asthmaticus. It does not respond to standard medication. That's deadly, guys. Acute respiratory failure due to respiratory muscle fatigue and pneumothorax atelectasis and pneumomediastinum. Question for you guys. Patient has asthma and nasal polyp. What kind of asthma does the patient have? Asthma plus nasal polyps equals aspirin sensitive. Aspirin. Excellent. Yeah. Aspirin sensitive asthma. So you avoid aspirin or any NSAIDs in these patients because they may cause a severe systemic reaction. Good job. Bronchiectasis, permanent abnormal dilation, destruction of the bronchial walls. Commonly, what's the most common cause? High yield cystic fibrosis. All right. Another one, um, Cartagener's syndrome. Clinical features, chronic cough, dyspnea, hemoptysis, recurrent persistent pneumonia. What's the diagnostic test? High yield, high resolution CT. High resolution CT scan. Treatment, of course, antibiotics, hydration, chest physiotherapy. The main goal in treating your bronchiectasis you, you is to prevent the complications which is pneumonia and hemoptysis. F, autosomal recessive, affecting Caucasians. What's the defect? Chloride channel protein, right? What, what chromosome number is a cystic fibrosis? Where, where is the CFTR gene located? 508. Your phenylalanine, a 508. Chromosome number? Seven. Seven. Excellent. Right? So what if I have a defect in my chloride channel protein? So impaired chloride in water transport. So you have excessive thick viscous secretions in the respiratory tract, exocrine gland, sweat glands, blah, 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 blah. Typical results in what? Obstructive lung disease pattern with infection. I wanted to highlight pseudomonas for CF. If the patient has CF, think pseudomonas infection. Also, pancreatic insufficiency and other GI complications. So what's the treatment? Pancreatic enzyme replacement. That's always the answer. They need pancreatic um, enzymes. Others, chest physical, um, physical therapy, yes. Some vaccinations. Oh, DNAs. Highlight this one. Inhaled recombinant human deoxyribonuclease, DNAs, which breaks down the DNA and respiratory mucus that clogs the airways. That's also one of the um treatment right answers in a nutshell your cystic fibrosis another high yield topic that they love lung cancer small cell versus non-small cell most common risk factors cigarette smoking don't forget adenocarcinoma has the lowest association with smoking of all lung cancers asbestos common in shipbuilding if the patient is a shipbuilder or in construction or car mechanic or painting think asbestos. Radon, if the patient is living in their parent's basement, think about radon. Staging, so we usually stage it via primary TNM um, system. So doctors, in the diagnosis of lung cancer, you need to differentiate whether it's small cell or non-small cell. Why? Because the treatment is different. Okay, so how are we going to know if it's small cell or not small cell? Easy, do a tissue biopsy. That always makes the differentiation. What's the clinical features? Local manifestations, right? Airway involvement, hemoptysis, blah, 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 recurrent pneumonia. Remember, signs and symptoms are generally nonspecific for lung cancer. 
and by the time that they are present, the disease is usually metastasized already. It is widespread. I want you to know local innovation though, high yield, SVC syndrome. So if you have a tumor, it can cause obstruction of the SVC, right? This is more, more, more commonly occurs with small cell, lung cancer. No defining, facial fullness, facial and arm edema, dilated veins over anterior chest, and JVD. Another one is Horner's syndrome. No other symptoms. Anhydrosis, ptosis, and meiosis. Panicos tumor or superior sulcus tumor involving C8 and T1 and T2 nerve roots, usually squamous cell cancer for panicos. So you have upper extremity weakness due to brachial plexus invasion. When you think about paraneoplastic um, syndromes, think about SIADH, think about small cell carcinoma. Um, Cushing syndrome, right, small cell, hyper hypercalcemia, squamous cell. Ethan Lambert um, syndrome is small cell, okay? Okay, prognosis of, please know those um, paraneoplastic syndromes, those are high yield. And what kind of lung cancer produces those paraneoplastic um, syndromes? So for lung cancer, you need to obtain what? You need to order chest x-ray, right? CT scan and a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and to determine the histology if it's a small cell or non-small cell. Diagnosis, chest x-ray, CT scan of the chest, cytologic exam of the sputum, you can have a lot. You can have a PET. You can have a transthoracic a needle, mediastinal. Um, there, you can do direct visualization of the superior mediastinum. Remember, fluid should be examined for malignant um, cells. Always perform a biopsy. Biopsy is always the correct answer in order to make sure the diagnosis is correct. Right. So treatment. Non small cell surgery is the best um, <clears throat> option. You can also do adjunct chemotherapy and radiation therapy. For small cell, we don't actually do surgery, we do like combination chemo and radiation um, therapy. All right, so the prognosis of, for lung cancer is actually grim. Over five years survival for lung cancer patients is 14%, 14% only. So it's very deadly. 85% of patients with um, small cell lung cancer, they have extensive disease. It, it has metastasized already in the body at the time of presentation. So um, it's very deadly. Right, put a star here. Know them well, please. All right, non-small cell, your squamous cell carcinoma, central cavitation and chest x-ray, adenocarcinoma, all right, most common type of your non-small cell, you have plural involvement, less likely associated with smoking, can be associated with pulmonary scars, large, large cell um, carcinoma, peripheral, small cell carcinoma, central, Narrow bronchi, think about widespread metastasis are very um, common. So sometimes previous x-ray is helpful, of course. And then we need to do like serial CT. And sometimes we can all, we can do like um, positron emission tomography, a PET, uh, PET scan. Um, what else? Plural effusion. So pleural effusion is, uh, we're talking now about diseases of the pleura, right? So you have increased drainage of fluid into the pleural space or increased production of fluid by cells in the pleural space. High yield, differentiate between transudative and exudative. Transudative, elevated capillary pressure, CHF, or um, decreased plasma oncotic pressure, hypoalbuminemia. Exudative, Think about increased permeability of pleural surface or decreased lymphatic blood flow. So you're going to tell me, Nick, how am I going to differentiate the pleural effusions? 
do the criteria, the lights criteria, to determine if it's a transudate or an exudate. What then is the lights criteria? High yield protein divided by protein uh, in the plural divided by the protein serum. It should be more than 0 0.5. LDH in the plural divided by LDH in the serum, more than 0.6. LDH is greater than two thirds of the upper limit of the normal serum LDH. So these are exudative effusions. If they meet the, the those three that I've mentioned, those are exudative effusions. In terms of pathophysiology, in terms of diseases, right? Transudative, think CHF, cirrhosis, pulmonary embolism, nephrotic syndrome, hypoalbuminemia, atelectasis, transudative. Exudative, think about infections, <clears throat> right? Um, bacterial pneumonia, tuberculosis, malignancy, think about viral infection, think about collagen, vascular um, diseases. What's the most common cause? So this is an x-ray, actually. So here you can have, look at A, look at the costophrenic angle on the left side. What's happening? You have blunting. Blunting of the, um, no, blunting of the, wait a minute, let me just see. Blunting of the right costophrenic um, <clears throat> angle. So you have a right plural effusion here. And then B, you have a left plural um, effusion. You have blunting of the left costophrenic angle on B. What's the most common cause of plural effusion CHF? Right? All right. Um, for plural fluid, okay? If they're going to describe you milky, like um, opalescent fluid, what do you think is this? Is it due to a malignancy? Is it due to TB, empyema? Um, what are we thinking? A milky? It's a milky, it's an opalescent fluid. Is it like a chylum? Chylothorax, excellent. So there's a lymph in the plural space. If they're gonna say in the vignette, it's a purulent fluid. Purulent fluid. Think empyema. There's a pus in the plural space. If they're going to describe the effusion as bloody, think malignancy. Right? If they're going to describe an exudative effusion that are primarily lymphocytes, lymphocytic predominance on your exudative effusion, think tuberculosis, okay? If they're gonna say elevated pleural fluid amylase, you have an increase in fluid amylase, think about pancreatitis, okay? Those are just some common things in the vignette to clue you in what kind of pleural fluid is extracted, okay? Don't forget, if the glucose in the pleural fluid is less than 60, Think about rheumatoid arthritis, okay? If the fluid glucose is less than 60, again, think RA. But however, caveat, glucose in pleural fluid can be low with other um, causes of pleural effusion. For example, TB, esophageal rupture, um, lupus, and empyema. Uh, clinical features, what can we see? You can read that one. Diagnose chest, um, x-ray, blunting of the costophrenic angle. You can see the pleural fluid. Um, what else? The most definitive is thoracosynthesis, thoracosynthesis. It also provides relief for large effusions. If it's transudative, you give diuretic, sodium restriction. If it's exudative, you treat the underlying disease. Commonly, you use um, chest tube in a um, patient, okay? For empyema, this is an exudative, a pus in the plural um, cavity commonly, complication of your bacterial pneumonia. So diagnosis, chest x-ray and CT. You treat them with thoracentesis, an antibiotic therapy. 
now they're high yield point, pneumothorax, right? Air in the airless plural space. Two categories, spontaneous and traumatic. Spontaneous, you have a simple pneumothorax. It occurs in quote unquote healthy individuals. Spontaneous rupture of subpleural blebs, commonly seen in COPD patients, bronchitis or emphysema. You have a spontaneous rupture of subpleural blebs, commonly seen in what kind of patients? COPD, bronchitis or emphysema? Anyone wants to take a guess? Emphysema. Emphysema. Excellent. Yeah, emphysema. You can have a spontaneous rupture of subpleural blebs. Common in tall, lean, young men. That's um, the population. It's most common. Secondary pneumothorax is a complication of underlying lung disease. Don't forget spontaneous pneumothorax. It has a high recurrence rate, like 50%. More than 50 in two years. What are the features? Chest pain, dyspnea cough, decreased breath sounds, hyper resonance, whatever. Diagnosis, chest x-ray, high yield to confirm the diagnosis. You can see the visceral pleural line. So what's the treatment then? If it's primary spontaneous, if it's small, observation and chest tube. If it's large, you give supplemental oxygen and needle aspiration or chest tube insertion. If it's secondary spontaneous, chest tube drainage. Now contrast that with tension pneumothorax, um, where there's an accumulation of air within the pleural space, such as the tissue surrounding the opening into the pleural cavity acts as some valves, allowing the air to enter but not escape. So what happens? Collapse of the ipsilateral lung. If I'm stabbed on the left and it perforates my lung, so my left lung will gonna collapse and my mediastinum will shift on the right. Okay, if I'm stabbed on the left, my left lung collapses and my mediastinum shifts to the away from the side of the pneumothorax. So it will shift to the right. Most common cause in hospitals, high yield, it's mechanical ventilation with associated barotrauma, CPR and trauma. Clinical features, hypotension, distended neck veins, shift of trachea, high yield away from the side of the pneumothorax. Treatment, this is a medical um, emergency. The patient is likely to die of hemodynamic um, compromise. Question doctors, do you, do you need an X-ray if attention pneumothorax is suspected? Clinically, you think, yeah, this is tension pneumothorax. Do you actually need an X-ray to confirm? The diagnosis? No. Why? Because this is a medical emergency, right? Yeah. If, if the clinical picture says, tension pneumothorax, do not obtain x-ray. What are we going to do? Decompress. So a large bore needle or place a chest tube. Look at the x-ray here. Look at A, all right? So <clears throat> tell me, right or left pneumothorax? Or A. Right or left pneumothorax for A. Left. Left. Right. <clears throat> and justify your answer. It well, I said left because the is darkened on the left side. So the lug might be collapsed. On that side because it's darker. So look, this is um, for A, right? On the top image, it's a right pneumothorax. Why the media sinus shift is on the left side? The pneumothorax is on the right side. You have an atelectasis on the right side, and the mediastinum is shifting on the left side. So this is a right pneumothorax. On B. And um, C, B is also a right pneumothorax. Um, so this is a complication of placing like a central line in the patient. So the central line, it just sits above the superior vena cava, right up to the entrance of your um, right um, atrium. It just sits there. So if something goes wrong, a complication of that is a, a pneumothorax, right? <clears throat> 
And C, C is a left pneumothorax or C. So A and B, it's a right pneumothorax and C, it's a large left pneumothorax. You can see the pneumothorax on the left side, the mediastinum shifts to the right. Okay, um, question, question, question here. Um, all right, for A, this is an example of um, right tension pneumothorax. Look at the mediastinum, it displaces on the left side. So this is a right tension pneumothorax. Um, for B, it's a left tension pneumothorax. And also C, it's a left tension pneumothorax with mediastinal um, shift on the right side. Okay. Um, with practice, you're gonna you're gonna be good at interpreting chest X-rays. Uh, did we talk about mesothelioma? I think mesothelioma is it's a it's a good topic. Right. So benign mesotheliomas, they have excellent um, prognosis. Um, malignant mesothelioma, most commonly seen in like asbestos exposure. But what's the most common cancer in um, asbestos exposure? It's not mesothelioma, it is bronchogenic carcinoma. So that's the correct answer. Okay, not mesothelioma. Most common bronchogenic um, carcinoma. So interstitial lung disease, a patient comes in to you. You are taking the history. So this is OSCE. What are we going to ask our patient if you suspect interstitial lung disease? Medication history. Check their medications. Now, doctors, tell me some drugs that are known to be toxic to the lungs. Leomycin. Leomycin, excellent. Your chemotherapeutic Busulfan. agents. What else? Busulfan. Busulfan, excellent. What else? Type 3 antiarrhythmics. Amiodarone. Amiodarone, type 3 antiarrhythmics. Excellent. What else? Uncomplicated UTI. Aside from Bactrim, you can give this one. Nitrofurantoin. What else? Penicillamine. Penicillamine. Um, also check for jobs. Right. For example, uh, asbestos, silicone, beryllium, coal. Right. And any other past medical history, if they have connective tissue disease or inflammatory bowel, IBDs, allergic rhinitis, asthma, or any kinds of malignancy. So, what is interstitial lung disease? Inflammatory process involving the alveolar um, wall, leading to irreversible fibrosis. That's it. Interstitial lung disease. Think about fibrosis, irreversible fibrosis. Know the classifications, please. You have coal workers, pneumoconiosis, silicosis, asbestosis, beryllosis. We're going to go over those later. If they have granulomas, think sarcoidosis, Langerhans cell hysteroidosis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, we no longer use Wegner granulomatosis. Why? Because Wegner is a well-known Nazi. Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, previously known as Churg-Strauss syndrome. Although Churg-Strauss is not a Nazi, we're updating now the term. So it's eosinophilic granulomatosis with poly. Angitis. That's why writer's syndrome, we're, we're no longer calling it writer's syndrome. Right? So anything that's associated with um, the horrific Nazi regime, it's being removed from medicine. Alveolar filling disease, you have good pasture syndrome, anti-GBM, antibody disease, idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis, alveolar peritonosis, some hypersensitivity lung disease, for example, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, eosinophilic pneumonia. We talk about drug induced. Know those drugs, bleomycin, phenytoin, amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, IPF, and COP. We're going to talk about that. So there's a lot of um, ILDs, doctors, over 100 cases, right? So if there are more than 100 
ILDs. How are we going to diagnose them? What's the most important thing in diagnosis? You obtain a tissue biopsy, high yield, always tissue biopsy, the most accurate, gold standard in determining your diagnosis. Okay, don't forget that there's a lot of ILDs. Clinical features, dyspnea, cough fatigue, yeah, B symptoms. A dry velcro, a velcro like rails, digital clubbing, yeah. Chest x ray, yes, you can see that one. Um, high resolution CT, PFTs, restrictive pattern, high yield. FEV1, FBC ratio is normal or increase. All the lung volumes are low, okay, but the ratio is often preserved. And you have a low diffusing capacity. Your DLCO is very, very low. Okay, you can do the bodge but it's controversial. Again, high yield tissue biopsy, please. Do a tissue biopsy. So remember, I remember like honeycomb lung. I remember this one, honeycomb lung. What do you mean by honeycomb lung? So it, it means you have a shrunken lung. This is an end stage finding. You have a poor prognosis. So it means the air spaces are dilated and you have fibrous scars in the interstitium. Honeycomb lung is very common in different types of ILD. It's not only specific to one interstitial lung disease, but to many different types of your ILD. Now let's go one by one. Sarcoid, sarcoidosis. Think non-cassiating granuloma, most common population, African-American population. Good prognosis in majority of patients. Clinical features, what's the most common? Um, constitutional symptoms, B symptoms, you can have that one. I want you to remember erythema nodosum. Erythema um, nodosum, okay? Think anterior uveitis for that one and some others. All right. What's the most common cause of death in sarcoidosis? Cardiac disease. Specifically what? Arrhythmias. Okay, that's the most common cause of death. Um, how, how do we diagnose? Based on x-ray high yield bilateral, bilateral hilar adenopathy. This is the hallmark of the disease. What happens to ACE? Increase or decrease? Increase. In ACE, what happens to calcium? Increase, right? So for sarcoidosis, I want your typical presentation, put it in your mind, young patient with constitutional symptoms, B symptoms, fever, um, dyspnea, respiratory complaints, shortness of breath, erythema nodosum, blurred vision, anterior uveitis, and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. That's it for sarcoidosis. There are different stages. High yield, what's the treatment of choice? Systemic corticosteroids. Pulmonary Langerhans cell histiocytosis, low yield, I think, um, related to the Langerhans cells of the skin. Cigarette smoking, most important risk factor. There are two kinds, letter C way and hand shoulder Christian, but I mean, those are low yield. Um, chest x-ray honeycomb appearance, of course, it's an ILD, right? Now let's talk about granulomatosis with polyangitis. So what is this now? This is necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis. So it affects the nose, right? The lungs and your kidneys basically. So you have disease including the upper and lower respiratory infections and glomerulonephritis. Again, it's an ILD. What's the gold standard for diagnosis? Tissue, biopsy, treatment, high yield, immunosuppressants, glucocorticoids. Poor Churg-Strauss, right? Churg-Strauss, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. His name is out, even though he's not a Nazi. Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. This is seen in patients with 
asthma, okay? Asthma. So you expect what? Eusinophilia. That's it. Typically presents with a rash, pulmonary infiltrates, and eusinophilia. Okay, question for you guys, all right? Where, where can we see um, elevated C anca? C anca. Wagner's. Um, granulomatosis with polyangitis, okay? GPA, please. Granulomatosis right. with polyangitis. How about P anca? Eusinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. Church stress. This, this um, on the actual um, step, they are not using Church Strauss syndrome and they are not using um, Wegner's anymore. They are using granulomatosis with polyangitis and eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis as the as the answer choices. So we're gonna use those terms, okay? So for C anca, you have GPA, right? Granulomatosis with polyangitis. How about for P anca? P anca is elevated in. Eusinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. However, question, P anca may be positive also in what disorder? What disease? Microscopic polyangitis. P anca? I'm thinking about um, good pasture. It can also be positive in anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody, or for example, your good um, pasture disease, okay? Don't forget that one. All right, let's, let's do environmental. Coal workers, pneumoconiosis. Of course, if they work in a coal mine, right, they can have um, this one. Causes inhalation of a coal dust. Asbestosis, right? Increased risk of what? Don't forget, bronchogenic carcinoma, right? Not mesothelioma. The most common is bronchogenic carcinoma. Asbestosis, they're going to have pleural plaques. That's high yield. For silicosis, they're going to say eggshell calcifications, okay? Silicosis, localized nodular. If they are a mason, like stone cutting, or they involve in glass manufacturing or mining, think about silly. Um, causes. Beryliosis, um, on the other hand, you have um, similar to sarcoid, granulomas, skin lesions, and hypercalcemia. So you give glucocorticoid therapy for both acute and chronic beryliosis. Beryliosis, I think, is um, nuclear plants, right? If I remember correctly, associated with those working in nuclear power plants. All right. Alveolar filling disease, anti-GBM or good pasture, high yield, it's um, type 2 hypersensitivity, right? Like your examples of type 2 hypersensitivity, myasthenia, gravis is there, you know, good pasture um, disease. So it results in what? Hemorrhagic pneumonitis and glomerulonephritis. How are we going to contrast Alport syndrome with good pasture syndrome? Only in good pasture syndrome you can have hemoptysis. Okay, don't forget that. Um, renal failure, of course, is a complication. You can have hemoptysis and dyspnea. Prognosis is poor. You can give plasmapheresis, cyclophosphamide, and steroids. Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, low yield. Chest x-ray, you can have like a ground glass appearance with bilateral infiltrates that resemble a bad wing shape. But I don't think that's, that's low yield. IPF, idiopathic. Why is it idiopathic? We don't know why is, it, why is this happening to our patient. Chest x-ray, honeycomb appearance. Of course, it's an interstitial lung disease. Most of them have honeycomb appearance. What's the treatment? Very limited. It's idiopathic. We don't, we don't know what's causing the pulmonary fibrosis. We, we, we only know that it's there. Okay? So supplemental oxygen, you can give like nintendonib or pifenidone, like your um, corticosteroids also, and lung transplantation. COP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonitis, similar to pneumonia, okay? You can have cough, dyspnea-like um, symptoms. I think this is low yield, 
um, corticosteroids are used most commonly. Another low yield, radiation, pneumonitis. If they're undergoing thoracic um, radiation therapy, for example, um, you can have low grade fever, calf chest fullness, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain. CT scan is the best study. Why? So that you can check the, the infiltrates, right? Treatment of choice, as for most of them, corticosteroids, right? So if you have a severe hypoxemia, low oxygen, it can uh, in the blood, it can result in irreversible damage to the organs. If you have severe, severe hypercapnia, increased CO2, and respiratory acidosis, it can lead to vasodilation of your cerebral vessels, which increases intracranial pressure and subsequent papal edema. Okay, high yield. Let's let's go to respiratory failure. Another one, acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome. So it's an inflammatory process involving both lungs. You have neutrophil activation in the systemic or pulmonary circulations. This is a disorder that arises due to other conditions that causes a widespread inflammatory process. What's the technique? How are we going to improve tissue oxygenation? Improve oxygen delivery? Decrease worker breathing? Remove pulmonary vasodilators? You increase FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen. You also increase the PEEP. Did you talk about um, positive pressure ventilation in class or not? No. Like non-invasive positive pressure ventilation like BiPAP or CPAP? Or that's for step two? No, we haven't no, talked okay, about No, okay, never mind, never mind. That's for, that's for step two. So pathophys, <clears throat> what's the pathophys for ARDS? Well, let's talk about the causes. Um, <clears throat> first, so sepsis is the most common risk um, factor. Aspiration of gastric contents, severe trauma. You can read all of <clears throat> that. So pathophysiology, okay? Four, acute respiratory distress syndrome. What happens? High yield. So you have massive intrapulmonary shunting of the blood. That's it. Meaning severe hypoxemia, decrease O2 in the blood with no significant improvement on 100% oxygen. Even though you give them high peep, right, to prop open the airways, the airways there's still nothing. 100% oxygen, right, positive PEP, still they're hypoxemic. Why? Shunting secondary to what? Widespread atelectasis collapse of the alveoli and surfactant dysfunction, okay? So what happens to the AA gradient then? If we have, a, if we have interstitial edema, you have alveolar collapse, you have increase in lung fluid. What happens to AA gradient? Increase or decrease? Increase, of course, right? And you have an ineffective gas exchange. What, can, what, what else can we see? Low vital capacity, increased dead space, decrease pulmonary compliance. Don't forget, patients with sepsis, remember we talk about septic shock. In septic shock, SVR is decreased. Systemic vascular resistance is decreased. For the rest, they are all increased. They have the highest risk of developing acute respiratory distress syndrome, okay? High yield sepsis, most common risk um, factor. Okay, clinical features, it's all there. Dyspnea, tachypnea, hypoxemia. Okay, high yield diagnosis. Diffuse bilateral pulmonary infiltrates. So that's it. You can have diffuse pulmonary vascular infiltrates. ABG, hypoxemia, of course, severe. AO2, less than 60. Pulmonary artery catheter. You can use this one to check pulmonary capillary um, wedge um, pressure, um, right? However, it has not been shown to be beneficial in ARDS or sepsis. Treatment, 
How are we going to treat someone who's in respiratory distress? Oxygenation, mechanical ventilation. Of course, if still you do oxygenation and O2 sat is still less than 90, use you escalate the oxygen delivery, right? BiPAP, CPAP. If it's still if, if it's still not working, the last resort is mechanical ventilation. Fluid management, of course, you don't want to overload the patient with fluid because if you overload them, it will increase their work of breathing. Okay. Another one, of course, if there's an infection, you treat the infection. What are the complications then of ARDS? Permanent lung injury. Okay. If they are mechanically ventilated, think about pneumonia or barrel trauma. Think about if you're placing central lines and pulmonary artery catheter lines to measure the PCWP, think infection. Renal failure, of course, stress ulcers if they're mechanically ventilated, multi organ um, failure. Pulmonary hypertension. So, pulmonary hypertension, we are now looking at the disease of the pulmonary vasculature. Your MAP, mean pulmonary, no, not, not MAP, mean pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than 25 at rest. Most, what's a pathophase? Left heart failure, mitral stenosis, atrial myxoma. There's a shunting, left to right cardiac shunting. For example, ASD or PDA. There's an obstruction, pulmonary embolism pulmonary artery stenosis, or there's a collagen and vascular disease, Marfan, Ehlers-Danlos, or pulmonary vasoconstriction. If the patient is obese, obstructive sleep apnea. If the patient has COPD or chronic hypoxemia. So, how are we going to de determine the cause of pulmonary hypertension? So you need to do chest x-ray, pulmonary function test, ABG, echo, cardiac, right? So that you differentiate if this is due to heart or lung as the cause of pulmonary hypertension. What is causing this pulmonary hypertension? Is it due to a heart disease, a, a recognized heart disease, or it is due to a lung disease? Now, if you do all of those things, still nothing. You can't decide which is which. You do a VQ scan, right? Ventilation perfusion scan to determine whether it's a pulmonary embolism or primary pulmonary hypertension, right? P-A-H. There's a classification for pulmonary hypertension. I think it's not that high yield, like the grouping and stuff. Um, let's look at the features instead. So you have constitutional symptoms. Ah, you have... Subtle lift of the sternum. We have a loud S, loud um, component of the second heart sound, the dub sound, and the lift of the sternum. These may be the only findings, and yet the patient may still have a devastating disease. EKG, right ventricular hypertrophy, of course. Ch uh, echocardiogram, you have a dilated pulmonary um, artery. What's the treatment here? What's the treatment? Vasoactive agents. You can give vasoactive agents. You can give nitric oxide, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Last resort, lung transportation. Core pulmonal is um, best thought of as a right-sided counterpart to your left ventricular heart disease due to systemic hypertension, which brings us to core pulmonal. This is a right ventricular hypertrophy with eventual right ventricular failure resulting from pulmonary hypertension. So first you need to have pulmonary hypertension. If it's not controlled, it can lead to core pulmonal, which is right ventricular hypertrophy, leading to eventually right ventricular heart failure. Okay, don't forget that one. Most common cause, I yield secondary to CO. ED. So many COPD patients die of right ventricular failure, secondary to chronic pulmonary hypertension, um, actually. Clinical features, you can read um, that. Degrees exercise, cyanosis, a para-sternal um, lift. In terms of the diagnosis, 
chest x-ray enlargement of the RA and pulmonary arteries, EKG, um, peak P waves, echocardiogram, you have a right ventricular um, dilatation. Um, I have a question for you guys. Um, sources of embolus to the lungs, right? A given example, um, long bone fractures, right? So you have a fat embolism, it goes to the lungs. Can you give me another source of emboli to the lungs? Okay. Again, please. DVT. DVT, oh yes. What else? Amniotic fluid, remember, during or after delivery, what else? Air embolism, a trauma to the thorax, or indwelling catheters, what else? IV drug users, septic, septic embolism. And what else? What else? Egypt, think about uh, snails. Mansoni. Schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis. Don't forget that. It can cause embolization to the lungs. Why? Where do they mature? In the lungs. Okay. No. It, it depends, right? If it's Japonicum or Mansoni, right? So, so there are different kinds of your um, schistosoma species. What's the treatment? Treat the underlying pulmonary disorder, use diuretics, you can give a vaso dilators. Okay, if a, if a patient with a long bone fracture develops dyspnea, mental status change, and petechia, think fat embolism, okay? Long bone fracture plus dyspnea, mental status, and petechia, always think fat embolism, which brings us to pulmonary embolism. What is this? A thrombus in another, in another region of the body, it embolizes, it travels to the pulmonary vasculature and it lodges there. What are the complications? Recurrent PE and pulmonary hypertension. DVT, most common um, risk factor, the source of the emboli, lower extremity. Um, DVT, PE is the major complication of DVT. Right, risk factors for someone for developing DVT or pulmonary embolism, if they're old, like I am, age more than 60 years old, <laughs> malignancy, if they have a prior history of DVT or PE, if they have um, hereditary hypercoagulable states, for example, factor V, laden deficiency, protein CNS, antithrombin 3 deficiency, if they long distance travel, right? If I go to Asia, if I go back to Asia or prolonged immobilization or bed rest, if they have CHF, if they're obese, if they have nephrotic syndrome, if they have um, pelvic surgery like orthopedic procedures, if they have major trauma, or if they're pregnant or estrogen use, don't forget OCP, they have an increased risk of developing DVTs. All right, talk about the pathophys. We talked about clinical features, dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, cough. You can read um, that. Diagnosis, ABGs are not diagnostic, actually, for your um, PE. Um, so what's the workup? If you suspect that the patient has pulmonary embolism, um, so you did a VQ scan, of course, you can do pulmonary angiogram. This is a definitive one, a pulmonary angiogram. And you can always use a D-dimer, okay? Chest x-ray is actually normal. So you do a venous duplex ultrasound of the lower um, extremities. However, this is helpful when positive, but little value when negative. VQ scan, of course. This was the most common test used when PE is suspected. And if the last one is a good sensitivity, is always CTA. So angiography, right? Good sensitivity. It can visualize small clots. Okay. Patient comes in, right? You're going to have this um, signs and symptoms of your um, PE. The patient is dyspneic, pleuritic chest pain, coughing. You have hemoptysis, right? You have a positive... Um, history of long travel. So you're, you're suspecting pulmonary embolism. 
So check what? D dimer. Check abnormal or normal. If it's abnormal, do CT scan, right? CT scan and check. If it's positive, leg ultrasound. Leg ultrasound, if it's still negative, but you think it's, it's um, PE, then do VQ scan or pulmonary arteriogram, okay? So you can do D-dimer, spiral CT, leg ultrasound, and then VQ scan or pulmonary arteriogram as the last um, resort. In the exam for um, pulmonary embolism, the gold standard is high yield pulmonary angiography. That's it, it um, diagnoses or excludes your pulmonary embolism. So there's a contrast that injected into the pulmonary artery after percutaneous catheterization of the femoral vein. You can also do D-dimer. D-dimer is actually a fairly sensitive um, test, right? How are we going to treat someone who has um, PE, supplemental oxygen, to direct, um, to correct hypoxemia? You could also get, give them acute anticoagulation therapy, like unfractured heparin, for example. Um, oral anticoagulation for long-term treatment, yes, warfarin. Remember, you need to bridge the, before initiating warfarin, you need to bridge, bridge it with heparin, okay? Um, you could also do thrombolytic therapy, like streptokinase, like your GPA. You could also do IVC filter, which has become more common now, okay? However, it doesn't do any reduction in mortality rate. So careful. So if a patient has PE and anticoagulation is contraindicated to that patient, the last resort is IVC filter. Okay? It's indicated. All right. You don't give anticoagulation in a patient with PE that has hemorrhaging, that is hemorrhaging, okay? And you can do surgical thrombectomy if there's a large proximal thrombus, but they are, they are poor candidates for fibrinolytics. All right. Um, let's see. This, okay, let's do some tests. So important for the last one, for the last part, I have uh, questions, guys, okay? So for pulmonary studies, right? So we do pulse oximetry. What's, the, what's this test? So it measures the percentage of oxygenated hemoglobin, right? What's the use if you suspect pulmonary disease? It's a screening test for detecting gas exchange abnormalities. Not specific and not sensitive. ABGs, ABGs, you measure the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as the pH of the arterial blood. ABGs is not necessary in all patients with pulmonary dysfunction, okay? Don't forget, this is very painful. I've done it during my IM rotation to, um, to my patient. It's painful. You can have radial artery spasm, can result in ischemia of the hand in patients with radial dominant circulation. Spirometry is used for what? To distinguish obstructive from restrictive, right? So useful in assessing degree of functional impairment. It may also detect respiratory impairment, right? However, don't forget, you need good technique for spirometry, right? So incorrect measurements or technique may lead to false positives. DLCO, diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide. So the patient breathes in a small specific amount of carbon monoxide, and the amount transferred from the alveolar air to the pulmonary capillary blood is measured. Don't forget, carbon monoxide is a diffusion-limited gas, okay? So other variables, other variables are eliminated. So basically, DLCO, you are measuring the surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane. Why are we using DLCO? To distinguish between asthma, emphysema, and COPD, high yield. Causes for low DLCO, emphysema, sarcoidosis, interstitial fibrosis, 
pulmonary vascular disease. Causes for high DLCO, asthma, obesity, left to right, cardiac shunt, exercise, forget that, and pulmonary hemorrhage. VQ scan, used for what? Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. So it compares the degree of ventilation to perfusion of the lungs. What's the normal ratio? One. If there is a high VQ ratio, what does it mean? It means there's an inadequate perfusion of an adequately ventilated lungs. Very rare to have a normal or negative VQ scan. VQ scans are ordered for evaluation of um, suspected pulmonary embolism. Last, metacoline challenge. What is this? To assess degree of airway hyperactivity, test for what? Asthma or COPD is suspected. So this is very sensitive in detecting airway hyperresponsiveness in mild asthma. I think that's it for tonight, guys. Thank you for staying up late. If you have any questions, please um, post on our Facebook page or please post on this chat. Next week, we're going to try to finish um, renal. Is that okay? And um, do you want hematology or? Yes. Hematology? Yes, yes, please, if you can. Like ALL, all of those stuff. Okay. All right. Yes. I'm going to try to do it next week then. Have a good night, guys. Good luck. You can do it. You're smart. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. Bye.